Why I'm here. Engineering organs to make people better. How many people out there have ever gotten out of breath? Whether with running, with illness, or even climbing up the stairs. In general, for most of us, that feeling passes. But for those with end-stage cardiopulmonary failure or chronic lung diseases, imagine that's what it's like all the time. Day in, day out, you're never stopping. For those of us who don't experience this, we have no frame of reference. It's debilitating. It's terrifying. Now let's imagine that you're a man named George, a middle-aged guy who's been healthy his entire life, working with machines, loving to ride his motorcycle, and he notices that things are just getting harder. He's a little short of breath. Over the next three to six months, things are worse. He goes to see his doctor, but they're not much help. Then he's huffing and puffing, walking, and then he's put on oxygen. Then he's told that he has a progressive, often fatal lung disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Told that medicines can't cure this. You only hold it at bay, and that he needs a lung transplant. There is no dialysis option. There are no mechanical pumps. Now he's put on five to eight liters of oxygen a minute, and he can hardly walk. It's a race, but he can't run anymore. He needs a cure. Traditionally, this cure has been transplantation. It's a bit ironic that we have a global supply chain problem. In transplantation, we have a shortage here too, an organ supply shortage. Let's look at this supply challenge. Over time, the demand for end-stage organ failure has dramatically increased. As a profession, we've increased the overall number of transplants to a point. For around the last decade, there have been relatively small increases in volume nationally, and this is mostly a reflection of donor organ shortage. For lungs, as an example, only around 23% of organ donors are able to have their lungs recovered for transplantation. This shortfall is what we're trying to address. Well, how do we do that? In addition to education and advocacy, one way is to make donor lungs healthier, so to speak. We're engineering organs and endothelial cells, or commonly known as blood vessel cells, to make organs better so we can help make people better. Well, how did I get here? To me, this is a blending of medicine and engineering. It's the true applied side of a whole bunch of basic and translational research that's gone on across the world for decades. My background is one of mechanical and biomedical engineering with a progression into surgery, cardiothoracic surgery to be more precise, and transplantation. In 2012, I was recruited to OSU to start the lung transplant program and build a translational research program. With the help of a lot of talented people, the support of our leadership, we've done both. The success is due to the synergy and aligned interest of treating end-stage lung failure in a heart hospital of all places, the Ross Heart Hospital. Some of what I'm gonna share with you are things that only seem like could be done in science fiction or at a place like Ohio State, a place where we can treat patients, go to the lab to investigate what we're seeing, and then go back to the bedside again. We're doing this in two ways. How we're doing this is utilizing novel ways of assessing organs using normothermic ex vivo organ perfusion. This is sort of space-aged, but in ex vivo perfusion, we're taking hearts and lungs and livers and kidneys outside the body and keeping them alive on miniature perfusion machines. The next slide and a few others are going to show live organs on ex vivo perfusion machines for visualization purposes. We're able to keep the organs alive, assess them and see how they're functioning. If the organ looks good and meets metrics, it can go on to save someone's life through transplantation. We're doing that now. How do we evolve the current approach to donor assessment? How do we resuscitate organs and repair them if they're damaged? One way is by treating the organ, changing the organs at a cellular level. We can deliver drugs directly to the cells to heal them and modify them, returning that organ to a healthier state. In lung transplantation, poor donor organ quality is an all too common reperfusion injury after transplantation. And this distills down to injury at the endothelial or those blood vessel cells. That injury to the blood vessel lining is in essence, leakiness. When you look at this image, the red river represents blood vessels and the light bulb, the alveolus or the air pockets in the lung. This leakiness is what we see with a lot of things, pneumonia, contusion, transfusion reactions, trauma, even COVID. Today, we're focusing on the lungs and its endothelial cell response or blood vessel lining leakiness, that red river in the image. That response to transplant reperfusion leakiness, either from within the river or from within the alveolus or that light bulb, leads to blood vessel permeability. This leakiness is every organ's response to an injury. The leakiness causes harmful inflammatory molecules, known as cytokines, to be released. We can all relate to this. This is why your ankle swells after you twist it. 
The ankle swells, it gets warm, it gets hard to move. In the lung, this leakiness and swelling and inflammation causes the alveolus, or that light bulb, to start to fill with fluid. This makes oxygenation harder and the lungs work less well, making it harder for you to breathe. Sometimes it's a little, sometimes it's a lot. We aren't always able to predict its degree, but it always happens after transplantation. At OSU, we've developed a way that we can treat and hopefully prevent this leakiness. Researchers in my lab and my collaborators' laboratories have developed novel proteins that are able to be used as drugs or medicines for these cells. We've identified important pathways of inflammation where we can intervene and stop this response. In cell culture, we can repair the damage from a lack of oxygen, also known as hypoxic injury. In transplantation, all organs are hypoxic or out of oxygen for a period of time when they're outside the body prior to transplantation. Those proteins, or medicines for the cells that I mentioned, we're able to deliver them where they can home into the cell injury and repair that cell surface or the cell membrane. In cell culture, we're able to turn off inflammatory pathways. One important pathway that we've been able to target and modulate is a pathway known as CD38. But the drugs we have to modulate CD38, they're not specific. Unfortunately, inflammation is helpful. We don't want to turn it all off. We need to get the drug to the right type of cell and in the right location within that cell so that the drug is able to have the most effect with the least adverse reactions. We can build nanoparticles or little targeted packages to deliver the molecules of drugs where we want them to go. To stop inflammation in the cell, we want to treat that ischemia reperfusion response when it happens at the time of transplantation. We can take potent inhibitors of the CD38 inflammatory pathway or any molecule really, package it up, coat it with antibodies that are attracted to those blood vessel cells. On the left, you see a controlled blood vessel cell culture. In the middle, you see those cells with just an antiparticle. And on the right, you see the antibody targeted antiparticle and is concentrated very highly in those blood vessel cells, only going where we want them to go. Now we're going to deliver these nanoparticles to the organ. We need it to get into the cells before transplantation. That way the drug can prevent inflammation inside the cell where it needs to be when the hypoxia happens. We're able to specifically target the area of the organ most at risk of injury, deliver the protective and reparative drugs to where they need to be to heal the organ and improve the overall outcome from transplantation. Where are we now? Today it's using normothermic ex vivo perfusion, and it is expanding the donor pool, letting us do more transplants for those who need them. Do you remember the gentleman that I mentioned earlier? He's George Costa. He's our first EVLP recipient at Ohio State from August of 2016. He's doing great, back at what he loves, but we still have a huge unmet need. People do die on the waiting list awaiting the gift of transplantation. We need to make that 23% of lungs that are being able to be transplanted much, much higher. So where are we going? What's our future? I believe it's melding these two treatment concepts. What you'll see is a lung undergoing EVLP followed by a heart. We're going to be utilizing normothermic ex vivo organ perfusion to assess and resuscitate organs. Once we understand what they need, we'll deliver specific targeted drugs to repair the organ and modify it, making it better for transplantation. Clinical trials with these novel drug interventions being delivered to the organs by ex vivo perfusion are just around the corner. To do that, we'll need to utilize the unique environment OSU has, one that merges the science with the clinic. We'll need to build upon our ability to assess four organs, heart, lung, liver, and kidney in OSU's Comprehensive Transplant Center, Organ Assessment and Repair Center. We're grateful to those who have believed in the research and helped us get to where we are. Ohio Third Frontier, the OSU Wexner Medical Center, our generous donors, and the great people in the Ross. When we're able to begin these groundbreaking clinical trials, we'll be able to expand the donor organ pool, improving the organs and making them better for transplantation, safer. We're building targeted therapies that we can deliver to preserve and recover lung function, both for transplantation and lung health. Do you remember those endothelial cells? Well, they're everywhere. Imagine if we can fix endothelial cells that are not only in the lung, but the heart, the liver, kidneys, not just for transplantation, but for other inflammation injury as well. Maybe we can use these targeted therapy approaches there too. Thank you.